and thank you everyone again for being here. Um, there's so many organizations and so many folks to thank. Uh, so I'm just gonna um, start that way th this webinar. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank our uh, co-organizer, uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Um, and thank you to the, all the Canadian civil society organizations, coalitions, networks, unions, whom we are very grateful uh, for their support uh, and whose names are listed on the, uh, on the side of our uh, Zoom uh, uh, call. Uh, so um, tonight's conversation will have uh, simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, our interpreters, uh, Talis and Mojde. Uh, Mojde. Um, and so um, as you know, she just uh, um, uh, gave us the instructions, uh, we have a Spanish and English inter interpretation. So uh, my name is Viviana Herrera and I'm the Latin American Program Coordinator at Manic Watch Canada. And I'll be uh, moderating uh, today's uh, session together with um, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute uh, Director, Bianca, who will be joining us, joining us uh, for the second half uh, of this webinar. So um, I think that before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Indigenous land, and I would like to invite you to acknowledge the territory that you are. Um, I acknowledge, for example, that I am on unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation, also known as Ottawa. So um, the title of um, today's panel is uh, Canada Closed Its Doors to Justice for Mariano Barca, What's Next? Um, this panel and today uh, is gonna be a unique and unique and great opportunity uh, to hear from the from the family of Mariano Barca and their Mexican and Canadian allies about their fight uh, for justice in Canada for the assassination of environmental defender Mariano Barca and why they've decided to bring this struggle to seek justice for Mariano here in Canada um, to an international instance. Uh, Mr. Barca, Mariano Barca, was a beloved community leader and human rights defender. And like many other environment and human rights leaders around the globe, he faced um, threats, intimidation uh, for speaking out about human rights violations, environmental harm tied to Canadian mining projects. In 2009, Mariano was assassinated with impunity for denouncing human and environmental abuses connected to the payback mining project owned by Canadian mining company, Blackfire Exploration. For more than 14 years, um, the family of Mariano Barca and its Mexican and Canadian allies have brought requests and legal challenges through to being to bring justice for, to those responsible for this crime in Mexico, but also here in Canada. For example, Jose Luis, the son of Mariano Barca and their me Mexican allies, uh, such as the movement of people affected by uh, mining, REMA and Otros Mundos Chiapas, came to Canada in 2018 to file a complaint with the Public Sector Integrity Commissioner in an effort to launch an investigation into whether the actions and omissions of the Canadian, Canadian Embassy in Mexico City put Mariano at greater risk. The Commission investigate the Embassy conduct in this case, and, the, and Canada's Federal Court of Appeal upheld the decision. In January 2023, just a few months ago, the Supreme Court of Canada denied leave to appeal the decision, effectively closing the door to any investigation by Canada, and in this way, denying justice once again to Mariano's family. This week, Jose Luis, 
the son of Mariano Barca and a representative of the Mexican network of people affected by mining, REMA, are back in Ottawa. They are here with me. They are back with a very specific objective in mind, which is to bring a complaint to, inter to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights against Canada. The complaint filed last Friday, just a few days ago, by the Justice and Corporate Accountability Project, Jacob, alleges that Canada failed to uphold its international human rights obligations when the Canadian Embassy in Mexico City pressured Mexican authorities to advance a Canadian mining project despite having knowledge about related threats to Mariano's life. Today, we'll hear more about all of this directly from Jose Luis, Esperanza Salazar, from REMA, who are here in Ottawa, and from Leah Garner, uh, and from Leah Garner, a lawyer with Jacob, who's jo joining us from Montreal, about the impunity and lack of accountability surrounding this case. The, uh, and also about the role of the Canadian Embassy in putting at risk Mariano's life. But also, and probably most important, about the long fight for justice in both Mexico and Canada. So, um, for our panel discussion today, we'll have uh, three speakers, as I just mentioned, and they will, they are going to have uh, 10 minutes each uh, to give their uh, remarks, and, and then we will have a Q&A uh, section. But um, just before we start uh, things off, uh, I would like to, um, I would like to start with a short video. Uh, these are um, this is a, these are this is just one video of many videos of a project by Dr. Lina Margarita Campos, and this is a project about women in resistance to Canadian mining in Mexico, um, specifically in Chicomuselo, Chiapas, and it um, this video alongside many uh, four or five uh, other videos identifies key questions. Uh, that we are going to try to answer during tonight's uh, webinar. Uh, but al it also, this video is also a tribute to Mariano Barca. And then, uh, and then after this video, we're going to have um, our speakers uh, sharing with us uh, some of their um, uh, uh, their, their stories um, uh, in order to seek justice in Canada. So um, I feel that the video is already up on the screen. So uh, Val, um, go for it. Thank you so much. Yo me siento feliz de vivir aquí en Chico Muselo, porque para nosotros nuestro pueblo es el mejor con sus dos ríos, uno caliente y el otro el frío. Y no es como en la ciudad que hay que comprar todo. Tenemos nuestros arbolitos de limón en nuestro patio y, y si no, tiene el vecino. Nos da alegría vivir aquí. Por eso, cuando supimos de la minera dijimos, ¿cómo es posible que venga gente de fuera a destruir eso que Dios nos dejó? Nos dio coraje Incluso fuimos a ver los grandes agujeros, las máquinas. Duele ver y más coraje porque cuando les preguntamos por qué se estaban llevando eso, nos dijeron, lo que llevamos no tiene precio, no vale. Todo empezó con el Frente Cívico. Don Mariano estaba con lo de la luz que era muy cara. Y de ahí lo de las minas, entonces tapamos la calle para que no pasaran los carros. Allí donde salían con los que es la varita. Íbamos a Grecia a reunir a la gente, pero estaba divididos, la mitad a favor y la mitad en contra. Creo que recibían 150 pesos por persona y pensamos venderse por eso. Nosotros luchamos porque escuchamos comentarios de que hay enfermedades. Muchos niños salieron enfermos, les salió mucha roncha. 
Los arroyos se secaron y mucho pescado se murió. Por eso no queríamos que sacaran lo de la mina. Estábamos contentas allí en la calle, allí hacíamos comida. Yo no sentía miedo de que me llevaran a la cárcel. Si no estábamos haciendo cosas malas, algunas decían que éramos revoltosas, unas locas, puras viejas revoltosas tiene don Mariano, decían. ¿Qué tienen que sacar con estar tapando la calle? ¿Qué no tienen que hacer en sus casas? Tenemos, pero esto es interesante para nosotros, decíamos. El día que mataron a don Mariano estuvo aquí, pasaron dos motos que lo estaban, como que lo estaban vigilando. Estuvo platicando allí, hasta parece que lo veo. Traía el gorgojo, así le decíamos a su jeep. Tardó para irse, estaba yo metiendo el pabellón en mi cama y entonces suena el teléfono. ¿Qué? Mataron a don Mariano. Yo sentí que me caí. Aventé el celular, salgo corriendo. Venía la comadre Susana caminando en el bulevar. Le grito, comadre, comadre, mataron a don Mariano. También ella cayó allí. Nos dolió una pérdida grande, lo sentimos bastante. Me hablaron para decirme, si quiere le puedo sacar un amparo. Porque ustedes vienen en la lista donde dicen que las van a llevar. Que me lleven, dije. No matamos ni robamos. Estamos peleando algo de nuestro mismo pueblo. Y nos decían, te van a matar. Que me maten, pues, por algo bueno será. Voy a quedar en la historia, les decía yo. Es por una lucha justa. Después seguimos con Luis Fuimos a México a pedir que se hiciera justicia por la muerte de don Mariano a la embajada de Canadá porque habían matado a un gran hombre, a un gran luchador. Perdimos a nuestro líder, pero también se logró que se fueran porque ya no siguieron. Y aunque la pérdida de don Mariano fue dolorosísima, uno se siente feliz porque... Ya quedó en paz aquí y no pasó como en San Luis Potosí que se secaron sus ríos y no hay nada de agua. So, um, that was our uh, video, a very powerful video um, that uh, really touching touch on very uh, important uh, issues uh, in terms of women resistance to uh, mining in Chicomocelo. But also, as I said, uh, uh, prior to the video, this was a tribute to Mariano's uh, life and defense uh, and protection of the territory. So um, now uh, we're gonna be joined uh, by Jose Luis Abarca, the son of Mariano Barca, who's gonna tell us about the long uh, struggle for justice uh, uh, that his family has been carrying out since 2009. So um, uh, thank you, Jose Luis, uh, for joining us. Uh, he's here in Ottawa, all the way from Chico Muselo a long way so um so we're very grateful for him to uh to to come to ottawa and share with us uh, with uh, canadians about the importance for us to um to call to call our uh, the canadian government uh, uh to help these uh, companies responsible and accountable uh for their uh, the canadian embassy in mexico role into uh, Mariano Barca's assassination. So, uh, Jose Luis, thank you. Buenas tardes. Good evening. Hace cinco años. Five years ago. Llegué a Ottawa. I arrived in Ottawa with colleagues from the Mexican network of people affected by mining and others to announce the administrative complaint 
we filed with Canada's Public Service Integrity Commissioner. We demanded an investigation into the actions and omissions of the Canadian Embassy in Mexico because we believe that they increased the danger my father, Mariano Barca, was in in the weeks and months before his murder. Since 2008, my father began a struggle together with other fighters in the town of Chico Muselo to prevent the Canadian mining company, Blackfire, from contaminating the water in the land through the exploitation of the mineral barite, barite, barite. This mining operation generated much concern in the community, awakening a resistance to this activity that has continued ever since. In particular, in particular, the mine generated erosion, loss of water sources, sedimentation in other water sources, mortality in cattle grazing that used to graze downstream. In addition, it operated through the corruption of the municipal president sought to generate social divisions. And when this did not work, it sent its shock group to intimidate those who denounced its mining operation, such as my dad. Therefore, as a community leader, my father's struggle was carried out during threats and attacks that both he and my family received including the beatings we both received from company workers in 2008. In August of 2009, Mariana Barca was detained for eight days on false charges brought by a company representative and subsequently was murdered on November 27th, 2009. During the entire time that Black Fire was operating in Chico Muselo, the embassy had significant knowledge of the local population's discontent with the company and also had information about my father and the risks he faced. In fact, my father traveled with others from Chico Muselo in July of 2009 to demonstrate and to protest about what was happening around the Blackfire mine. In front of the Canadian Embassy. Speaking about the negative environmental and social impacts. As well, as well as the threats he had received. In documents that our Canadian allies were able to obtain after requests under the Access to Information Act, we were able to see that the information that the embassy had was very detailed and began even before the mine went into operation. We also learned that the company considered the embassy's support essential. For example, in an email we were able to access from the company to the embassy after securing an explosives permit, it said, we could not have done it without your help. Coming to file our complaint in Canada, our expectations are that the Canadian authorities would have given a favorable response. However, we have been met here with the same unwillingness and lack of seriousness to investigate the case with which we have been confronted. Nevertheless, and where the uh, companies have impunity and those who support them, this lack of respect and seriousness is even more severe. If 
the border region of Chiapas in a situation of terror due to a dispute for territorial control between organized crime groups seeking control of the corridor of goods and illegal substances between Mexico and Guatemala. And also armed people have entered to loot minerals previously, previously extracted by Black Fire. In the last two years, there has been an increase in robberies, extortion, and uh, dispossession of other livelihoods, kidnappings, forced disappearances, and forced recruitment, death threats, femicides, and murders. Recently, at least 3,000 people have been displaced forcibly. It is a situation of anxiety that harms all of us, affects all of us, even including the possibility of remaining in our communities is harmed. However, the continuity of impunity and the collusion between these groups with different levels of government and the lack of effective response to stop it generates a lot of uncertainty about how this can be resolved. We know that this is happening in more and more regions of the country that are also rich in minerals and other goods where communities are being emptied while the companies continue to operate. When on top of this, there are foreign governments such as Canada that promote their investments without taking a look at the enormous damages that this involves or the context of violence in which they operate, this really leaves us in a situation of defenselessness. In the face of all of this, my family considers it even more important to continue raising our voices to seek justice from the government, governments of Mexico and Canada for what happened to my father and my community. Because we don't want it to continue happening, especially given the conditions we are living in now with so much violence and facing the long-term damage that always accompanies mining. It's really necessary that for Canada to stop providing support to corporate greed, this greed that continues to plunder and kill us in Mexico and other parts of the world. We want, we want our complaint against Canada to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to help us to demonstrate and argue this, to establish Canada's responsibility, the Canada that, the responsibility that Canada has, and we know that this is far from being the only case of its kind. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jose Luis. Uh, and just to uh, give uh, an FYI for our interpreters and Leah, because uh, uh, just to make sure that we, because next we have Leah Garner. Um, and Leah is going to be actually talking about what uh, Jose Luis just mentioned during his presentation. That is to say, the complaint to the uh, Inter-American Inter Inter Commission on Human Rights. Uh, but before that, I would just like to say that Leah is a lawyer on the board of directors of the Justice and Corporate Accountability Project, Jacob. Uh, which help uh, to bring this complaint uh, to Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Jacob is a volunteer-driven transnational collab collaborative community-based legal clinic uh, based in Canada. Jacob assists uh, in holding corporations and states to account by offering legal knowledge and advocacy support 
to communities that are negatively affected by natural resources uh, extraction. So uh, Leah, thank you uh, so much for being here with us. Uh, it's been a couple of busy days. Uh, she was uh, with us yesterday here in Ottawa as we launch uh, the petition uh, during a press conference. Uh, so uh, again, thank you so much for joining us, uh, joining us again uh, today. Uh, thank thank you. you, Viviana. And apologies ahead of time if you uh, hear my toddler in the background. <laughs> um, so I'm joining from Montreal, located on unceded Indigenous lands. Uh, I recognize the Ganagahaga people as custodians of the land I'm on. Um, so I'm going to speak to the complaint itself, um, why we're bringing it, well, what it says, and what we hope will come of it. Um, so we're bringing this complaint to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights because we believe Canada bears significant responsibility for what happened to Mr. Abarca and should be held accountable under international human rights law. As uh, Jose Luis mentioned, the Abarca family has tried for years to get Canada to look into this case and implement policy changes to make sure that this doesn't happen again. In 2018, um, they made an official complaint to Canada's Public Sector Integrity Commissioner, asking him to investigate embassy conduct in the two-year period leading up to Mr. Abarca's murder. The commissioner refused to investigate, and Canadian courts upheld that decision. One of the reasons the commissioner gave for not investigating was that embassy staff didn't have to follow Canada's own uh, corporate social responsibility policies in place at the time, um, that those policies were voluntary. Um, when we went to the federal court, lawyers for the government uh, even argued that Canada has no legal obligation to ensure that companies respect human rights overseas. So for us, the viewpoint that Canada's international human rights commitments are voluntary for Canadian officials promoting mining in developing countries is incredibly problematic. And we argue in the petition that that viewpoint helped to create the situation that led to Mr. Barca's murder. So the embassy <clears throat> helped get the project off the ground uh, and vigorously advocated for the company without doing any apparent human rights due diligence or uh, considering the context that Jose Luis just described or even um, considering the opinion of affected communities. We argue that that increased the risk to Mr. Abarca's life. So uh, for example, um, Jose Luis mentioned a few of these, um, but I think it's important to lay it out. Um, access to information documents show that the embassy offered the company a great deal of essential support, helping set up meetings with local officials, helping to secure a much needed explosive, explosives permit, uh, and frequently advocating on the company's behalf. They continued in this support, even when Mr. Abarca went to the embassy and told them directly that mine workers were threatening him and other community leaders. Not long after, the company made a criminal complaint against Mariano Abarca and Mexican police detained him for uh, about eight days without charge. The embassy at that time received, I think nearly 1400 emails uh, explaining who he was and expressing concern for his safety. 
while he was detained, the embassy forwarded uh, an email to Mexican officials suggesting that groups associated with Mr. Abarca might be planning a violent takeover of the mine site. And about a month before he was murdered, when tensions were at their highest and the community was complaining about threats from armed mine workers, the embassy organized a high-level delegation to Chiapas to pressure officials to continue to support the project and counter protests. They don't appear to have ever mentioned to Mexican officials um, you know, the importance of uh, keeping community leaders safe. A few weeks later, Mr. Abarca reported to Mexican police that a mine worker had promised to pump him full of lead. And not long after that, he was murdered. So the complaint argues that um, once the embassy learned that he was at risk, they did nothing to help protect him and actually piled on the risk in the months before he was killed. Canada never investigated or provided a path to remedy in Canada. And we argue that in, in that way, the Canadian government violated Mr. Abarca's life, right to life and related rights under international human rights law. Four individuals associated with the company were detained following his murder. I believe there was one conviction at the trial level which was overturned. Mexican courts ordered the public prosecutor in Chiapas to reopen the investigation uh, and they appeared to have ignored that order. So no one has been held accountable for this tragedy. Uh, and it doesn't look like Canada has learned anything from it either. Uh, violence linked to Canadian mines in developing countries has been a widespread problem for a long time. This is not an isolated incident. Um, and without stronger laws, Canadian officials will continue to be implicated in this violence as uh, the Abarca case shows. So we hope this complaint to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights will push Canada to take immediate steps to end support for Canadian mines in the global south that are linked to violence and human rights violations. And we'll, we hope it also pushes Canada to engage with the Abarca family and their supporters to provide a remedy for the harm suffered. We also hope it will encourage Canada to finally adopt industry regulations with teeth. Uh, I mentioned the voluntary uh, corporate social responsibility guidelines for embassies at the time that Mr. Barco was killed. Uh, since 2009, Canada has created new corporate social responsibility guidelines uh, the new Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise, um, and even a new policy that's very detailed on protecting human rights defenders like Mr. Avarka. It's called the, the Voices at Risk Guidelines. The problem with all of them, in my opinion, is that they continue to be voluntary, which makes them ineffective and you could even argue harmful because they're doing a PR job for this incredibly harmful extractive industry while doing very little to regulate it. So um, we're hoping the complaint will, will push Canada to pass mandatory human rights due diligence legislation. Uh, the Corporate Respect for Human Rights Act, or Bill C-262, is, uh, uh, I believe, currently before Parliament. Um, we also hope it will push Canada to strengthen its Voices at Risk policy on supporting human rights defenders by creating mechanisms to ensure that 
public officials are actually abiding by it. Um, so that's all for now. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, uh, Leah, for for that uh, important uh, legal context about uh, the petition. It was very clear, something that sometimes could be very complicated to, to understand, uh, I feel. Uh, before we uh, go on to our last uh, panelist, I would like to remind everyone that um, there is a Q&A box and that if you have uh, you know, any questions for our uh, our panelists, um, feel free to just drop them there and then we are gonna collect them and um, answer your questions uh, at the end of the webinar, just actually um, right after this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so um, without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Esperanza Salazar. Uh, Esperanza uh, is a member of the Mexican network of people affected, affected by mining, um, an, organiz an organization that accompanies uh, communities uh, resisting uh, to mining and to demand accountability. Um, and since the murder assassination of uh, Mariano Barca, uh, she, um, they have accompanied the family in its struggle for justice uh, for this crime. Um, Esperanza, is also a, a, a member of uh, RISOM, an organization that does uh, research, documentation, information sharing, and building relationships with strategic allies to strengthen local, organ, orga, local organizing processes uh, based on equitable participation and knowledge exchange. Uh, with communities uh, affected by extractivist uh, projects uh, uh, in the region, in Mexico. So uh, Esperanza, again, like Jose Luis, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming all the way from Mexico. I know that uh, um, it's been a, a long uh, uh, a trip um, to, to Canada. And I just wanted to, uh, to ask you, you know, because of the experience of REMA accompanying communities and the fact that we know that Mexico is known to be one of the most uh, uh, mining affected con countries in Latin America with uh, um, a, being one of the, um, the countries with uh, the most number of um, human rights and environment uh, defenders being um, killed and intimidated uh, in the region. How has REMA uh, has been documenting the impacts uh, of Canadian mining um, in, in Mexico. And what do you think that um, this fight for justice for Mariano has uh, revealed in terms of the role of Canadian mining um, in, the, in Mexico? Um, so Esperanza, welcome and uh, thank you. ¿Qué tal? Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. As was mentioned, Mariana Barca, we are here petitioning for his justice. We are coming back once again, and it hurts us and it gives us, uh, makes us angry also. The fact that the Canadian government doesn't even have any willingness to open an investigation in this case. The assassination of Mariana Barcas was mentioned is not something unusual, isolated, or accidental. It faithfully reflects a pattern of behavior that incorporates several elements of a policy based on the management and generation of mining conflicts. This includes criminalization, harassment, threats, and, sh and smear campaigns, repression, and murder against defenders of life and the environment in the territories affected by this destructive activity. This pattern has been applied for years in Mexico and throughout Latin America, where companies 
the three levels of government, as well as governments such as Canada, through its embassy and diplomatic corps, intervene to guarantee investment. In particular, for us at REMA, the experience we had with Black Fire in Chico Moselo, Chiapas, is an example of the way mining companies operate to break the social fabric and enter the territories. In this case, with a lot of support from the Canadian Embassy in Mexico. Contrary to the Canadian government's discourse, and I wanna make sure that the slide is being seen. We can see here on the slide that there is even a check that the ex-municipal president received from the company. It seems like he wasn't the only one and it wasn't the only expense. It seems like they also got some plane tickets and other things for their families. This is the way in which the companies go into territories. They divide, they go up against groups, they use shock groups to impose their projects. And it's important to mention how the, the Canadian embassy has a, had a role that was very important for the defense of their company because they knew exactly the embassy knew that Mariano was being threatened. Over 1,400 letters and emails were sent to the embassy to demand Mariano's security and safety. However, they keep saying that they had no responsibility. Contrary to the Canadian government's discourse on human rights, and corporate, corporate social responsibility. This case demonstrates the Canadian government's singular interest in promoting and protecting Canadian capital. In the course of its review in the federal courts, the government defended itself by arguing that its commitments to the lives of human rights defenders are not binding. The lack of seriousness and depth with which this process has been treated reveals moreover a disdain and a great lack of respect for those who suffer the damages of the mining industry, giving preference to the enrichment mainly of a few businessmen at the expense of life, blood, safety, and nature. Along with the presence of many allies, we filed the original complaint in February of 2018 directly with the Office of the Public Service Integrity Commissioner of Canada. However, a few months later, the commissioner refused to open an investigation, saying that his corporate social responsibility policies the statements from government representatives and the commitment in front of the UN of Canada to the protection of human rights defenders are not, this is what they said verbatim, are not official government of Canada policies and do not appear to dictate specific actions that the embassy should have taken or not at the relevant time. The embassy was therefore not obligated to follow them and consequently no investigation was warranted. The federal court and later the federal court of appeals upheld this decision. In doing so, they made almost null and void the analysis of all the information we had provided. However, federal judge Boswell admitted, and this, these are his words, undoubtedly petitioners would have liked the embassy to have acted in a certain way. And perhaps Mr. Abarca would not have been killed. 
Before the Federal Court of Appeals, three groups intervened. Amnesty International Canada, Canadian Lawyers for International Human Rights, and Ryerson University's Center for Free Expression. They argued Canada's obligation to comply with international law to investigate and ensure an effective remedy. And they also argued that the absence of an investigation could undermine public confidence in the public administration. However, none of this was taken into account. In the end, the Supreme Court of Canada did not grant our request to review the case, despite its importance to defenders of life in the face of the disposition, dispossession and social and environmental destruction of hundreds of Canadian mining companies that are operating around the world and the increasingly grave danger in which they find themselves. Mexico, is already one of the most dangerous countries in which to defend land and territory. But the Canadian government's unconditional promotion of its mining companies and the vacuum in terms of prevention and prosecution is especially serious in the face of the deepening extreme violence in recent years in Mexico. In parts of the country that have seen a tremendous escalation of murders, disappearances, and forced displacement, Canadian mining companies can be found operating and expanding their operations. In such a context, the dim diplomatic promotion of mining investment by the embassy, the foreign ministry of the prime minister himself, as he did during his visit to Mexico earlier this year, it magnifies our impression that life in our southern countries is really not worth anything to the Canadian government, while they can still continue to operate the companies that capitalize on their stock exchanges. The most recent example is the request that Trudeau made to AMLO, to the Mexican president, asking him to attend to a couple of companies operating in Guerrero that were complaining of being extorted. This meeting culminated in a quick and favorable response from the Mexican president. Neither of the two leaders took into consideration that murders, disappearances, forced displacement, kidnapping, and extortion threatened the lives of the entire central zone of the state of Guerrero, where mining companies such as Torex Gold and Equinox Gold operate. Despite the terror that plagues these and other mining areas, the Canadian government continues to promote its investments regardless of what it means for the people. It is time that the lives and well-being of communities and workers are put above the blatant pandering to the devastating mining industry. For all these reasons, we reaffirm our commitment to continue with these, this process now that it's being taken to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, where we hope to achieve a response that addresses some substantive changes that begin to remedy injustices such as the community division, corruption, displacement, destruction, inequality, environmental destruction, deeper poverty, inequality, environmental destruction, increased poverty, in illness, alcoholism, drug addiction, vandalism, prostitution, violence, repression, and death. We also reaffirm a commitment to the destruction of violence and the destruction that mining brings to the territories where it goes. Thank you so much.
Hey, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Viviana. Oh, Viviana, I'll let you, I'll let you do the honors. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just going to say that exactly. I wanted, uh, I wanted to uh, invite you. So uh, thank you for being already there. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, Bianca, as I said in the beginning, uh, she's going to be moderating uh, the Q&A. Uh, so uh, I see questions already lining up. So uh, take it away. And uh, Bianca is with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Bianca. Thank you. Thank you so much, Viviana. And thanks again to Jose Luis, uh, Esperanza, and Leah for um, those incredibly illuminating and very important uh, presentations um, in the struggle for justice from Mariano Abarca and against the terrible harms uh, that we've heard about uh, today and the unbelievable impunity um, of Canadian mining companies. It is very encouraging to see this tour taking place, um, these meetings with politicians happening and, uh, and even coverage in the mainstream media. So uh, really wonderful work. And, and as Viviana mentioned, we are now in the Q&A. Thank you so much to the audience for being here and for your questions. It's great to see all of this interest. Um, so I am I'm going to start with uh, a question from uh, Rick, um, who wants to know, uh, after, um, after Blackfire abandoned the open pit mine, has there been any effort to remedy the damage caused by the governments? I'm wondering if any of our panelists can answer this. And, and also I'd like to ask um, our panelists uh, to switch on your cameras if you can as well, so that um, we, can, we can see you and have uh, a conversation. Thank you. Um, Leah, is this something that you could speak to? Uh, no, not, not me personally. I don't, I don't know if they have... Uh... I, I, I can't speak to that, no. All right. Um, Esperanza, Jose Luis, um, do you have any um, any insight into uh, what happened after Blackfire abandoned the open mine uh, pit? Um, eh, bueno, sabemos que no hay, no hay ningún, por supuesto, ninguna reparación. We know that there's, of course, no reparations have been made. As Jose Luis mentioned, the violence has increased enormously. So this is part of the difficulties, the problems that this uh, mining company left behind. Did you want to add anything else? Yes, after the, the death of my father, We have had no reparation of damages uh, from the death of my father. And on the contrary, we've had to uh, continue uh, trying to have the reparation of damage be at least justice, find getting justice for what happened to him. Thank you. Thank you, Esperanza. Thank you, Jose Luis. Uh, the next question that we have is uh, from Carlos, um, who uh, has a question for uh, Ms. Salazar and wants to know whether they have resorted to the National Human Rights Commission or the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I'm not sure if either, if, uh, if uh, uh, Esperanza, do you have any insight into that question? Uh, Bianca, can you repeat the question, please? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, um, have they resorted to the National Human Rights Commission or the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights? I'm not sure I understand that question, actually, uh, myself. But um, if, uh, if, if any of the panelists want to speak to, um, to the petition uh, that has gone forward, uh, go ahead. Hold on one second. Sí, de hecho, a la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos en México. Yes, to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights in Mexico, we have recurred to them. 
and now uh, with the demand the 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 demand that we are putting in uh, that we put and uh, now uh, to the Canadian government thank you so the next question we have is about the Mexican authorities. Uh, where are the Mexican authorities in all of this? Um, uh, the questioner says it's the responsibility of the state of Mexico to provide rights and security to its citizens. So where, where are the authorities on all of this? Um, Leah, do you want to take a shot at this one? Uh, sure. I mean, I'll just say, uh, I mean, I think Canada and Mexico are jointly responsible here in different ways. Um, and the Abarca family and their allies have brought a petition against Mexico um, as well to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. So there are now two petitions, one against Canada, one against Mexico. Um, I could talk about maybe the technical argument for <laughs> Well, how there could be joint uh, yeah. responsibility if we have time. Yeah, a little bit. I think. We're um, okay. Yeah. So in the inter-American system, uh, countries can be held responsible for human rights violations against individuals in other member countries when the uh, impugned country exercises jurisdiction over that person. So jurisdiction in the context of the inter-American human rights system um, means exercising some form of state responsibility, authority, or uh, effective control over that person. So the case law shows that that can mean exercising significant influence over protected rights directly or indirectly through third parties, particularly when uh, extraterritorial harm is foreseeable and particular particularly when that harm is very serious so serious harms can include violations of the right to life or bodily integrity uh, especially if the targeted person is a human rights defender which mr barca was um, so in this case in the case against canada we argue that the canadian embassy became heavily involved in the mining conflict, and by extension, Mr. Abarca's right to life. They had influence over the company, they had influence over Mexican officials, and the embassy knew Mr. Abarca was a human rights defender and that there was a real risk to his life. So we argue that that created an obligation under international human rights law to respect and protect his right to life, in addition to uh, Mexico's obligation to do the same. Thank you for those useful details and um, just elaborating on, on, on the legal aspects of that. Uh, Viviana, um, Jose Luis, or uh, Esperanza rather. Sí, pues, la pregunta es, ¿dónde están? Look, the question is where, what are the Mexican authorities doing? They're doing the same thing as the Canadian authorities. They are denying justice for the community, for the people, and they are supporting the companies and they're covering up for the companies with their false solutions and with their mechanisms, the mechanisms of corporate responsibility. So, Thing. So that's why we are the Canadian government are have wanted to support uh, in this sense. It's a completely uh, a joke that the for the companies to uh, have a have a, a complaint and the next day they have an, a response from the Canadian and then the Mexican uh, governments. So we are in this, we are still uh, struggling. Thank you. We have a question from Bob who was asking if uh, panelists can clarify exactly what offenses the mining companies commit and how the cartels link to that. 
Uh, Jose Luis. Sí, este, mi padre estaba, sí, My estaba... father was uh, protesting peacefully, something symbolic about what the mining uh, company was doing. And without asking the uh, community members and the contamination that was being caused, and also the threats that he was receiving and the family, family and other collaborators who were against the mine. So that's why the mining company had a, a, a group, a, a shock group or a, a armed group who used to do the dirty work of intimidating the population. And these people are linked to the drug trafficking and weapons trafficking, drug and weapons trafficking. So these people are involved, these shock groups are involved in, the, in these environments. And also, this is not something isolated. This is something that happens in the whole country in places where organized crime is uh, displacing entire communities where there are so many people disappeared and murders. Well, it has to do with territory, uh, territories where the extractive projects are being imposed. So there is a collusion very clear between the governments, the companies, private companies, and organized crime in order to displace from the territories, the communities, and in order to take over, to displace them and take over that territory in order to exploit it. Thank you, thank you, Esperanza. So we have um, a question about the tour that's taking place uh, in Canada right now um, with the family and allies. Um, Lisa wants to know, have Rema uh, Abarka uh, Gardinev been able to speak with members of parliament and how much parliamentary support is there for forming the legislation to make rules obligatory rather than voluntary? Um, I'm not sure if you've been uh, been following uh, the tour itself, but Leah, if you have any insight into that, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, sure, I, I don't, I can't, I don't really know exactly what's going on in the, the House of Commons. And we've met with a, a few uh, members of parliament uh, 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 yesterday and today. Um, with the, the NDP and the bloc. So the two of the opposition parties, there seem to be the bloc Quebecois, there seem to be um, interest there from, from those two parties, but you know, the mandatory, the, the push for mandatory regulation and not voluntary regulation has been going on for a long time. It seems to be a really tough issue to, um, to, to get the parliament to act on. Um, but there's there's also a really strong you know civil society movement in Canada and in Latin America pushing for that. So so I'm I'm hopeful that that it will happen at some point. Um, Jose Luis, uh, how is the tour going? Este, sí, hemos estado um, participando. Yeah, we've been participating with members of Parliament and with other NGOs. Visibilizing this, this complaint and for the participation that the embassy maintained with the mining company and the omission 
a clear omission of the Canadian laws as far as the transparency or the participation of the embassy, the, the acts of corruption that happened. I think tomorrow we'll be traveling back to Mexico, but it has been it has been very fruitful our trip here. And I think we're fulfilling our expectations for this to be known for all the media to visibilize our petition. Yes, we have had, as has been mentioned, several meetings. We had one with the advisor for the Ministry of Economy, Mari Engi. And it wasn't a surprise, of course, that they started to, to show off that they have their mechanisms and their mechanisms like like the omnis person and that they are trying to do a law against slavery. And so in some way, this law is going to continue uh, fighting for this office of the omnis person to be able to act better. Uh, however, we did make her see clearly that we don't agree with those mechanisms, that we think they are mechanisms to legitimize the displacement. And on the other hand, we think that, but we thought that we did have to mention that while she's telling us that what they want to do is respect human rights and that they want to improve, on the other hand, we know that the minister herself, and she was in Mexico lobbying for the mining companies to be able to be at a negotiation table with the Mexican government. And we feel that to be able to to review the new mining law or mining bill for them to be able to to settle in into that law somehow that of course we know that it's a it's a law or a bill that is not giving much for communities to be able to defend themselves and on the contrary we believe that there are things that are truly horrible like the fact that communities now have to be consulted that the indigenous communities especially because we know that it's a trap that these consultations are are rigged that there's many ways in which the companies have done these consultations and it doesn't work and on the other hand the consultations are not for the community to be able to say no they are for the negotiation and the law clearly states that it's to benefit the investment on the part of the companies Thank you, Esperanza. Um, we have a question about the Mariano Abarca Foundation. Uh, Jose Luis, can you tell us about the uh, the foundation, um, its work, and and how we can support it? Yes. After my father's assassination, I created a foundation with the group that he had. We started to do some local actions in Chicomocelo. 
And similarly, uh, protesting against mining and having the participation with Rema and with Otros Mundos, Chiapas, but it was created with that group that, that my father had. Thank you. Uh, so people uh, at home, please do find more, uh, find out more about the uh, Mariano Abarca Foundation and, uh, and how to support it. And uh, we'll put a link to that in the chat. Um, the next question that I have it was submitted in advance um, and I'm going to direct it towards Leah. What makes this a groundbreaking petition? Um, well, I'd say the first thing is we're talking about extraterritorial obligations. So we're saying, we're arguing that Canada uh, had the obligation under international human rights law um, to um, do what it could to um, uh, to uh, prevent harm to Mr. Barca, uh, who was a human rights defender. So I think there's the the uh, extraterritorial obligation aspect. Um, there's also, um, well, yeah, I guess it's it's sort of linked. So the fact that uh, Mr. Barca was outside of Canada. Um, and also uh, the issue of the Canadian embassy. I think this is the first complaint with, the, with these to the Inter-American Commission um, that uh, puts the actions of, of the Canadian embassy in question in the context of uh, economic diplomacy in Latin America. So it's sort of um, unique in terms of the facts. And it's also, um, you know, pushing international human rights law forward uh, in terms of um, the recognition of the importance of extraterritorial obligations for uh, home states um, in the context of the extractive sector. So when I say home states, I mean rich countries like Canada where um, these mining companies are located and financed and, and publicly supported. Thank you, Leah. Um, we have uh, a question about uh, uh, AMLO uh, and uh, Mexican government. Uh, Carlos wants to know what has been the reaction from Alejandro Encinas in the Secretaria de Gobernación or the President López? Um, Esperanza, Jose Luis, uh, any word from them? Uh, Bianca, would you mind repeating the question? I'm sorry. No problem. What has been the reaction um, to this case, um, uh, if at all, uh, from Alejandro Encinas in the Secretaria de Gobernación or President López? And I, I guess perhaps if there hasn't been, uh, you know, what, what are the stances they've been taking around these issues? Yeah, there has not been any reaction. None, no, no declarations, nothing about the subject matter. Thank you. Um, so a uh, question for uh, Esperanza and, and Lee as well, if you'd like to weigh in. Sorry, Vivi Viviana or Esperanza? Did someone want to say something? Okay. Um, yeah, so what can the government do to protect human rights defenders? Um, I wanna direct this question at Esperanza um, first and also uh, Leah, if you'd like to weigh in. I think something that can be, that people can do is to stop mining in the country the federal government has been saying that they're not going to give any more concessions for more mining industries to come. But so far, we're talking about having 23,000 concessions. And this new 
reform that was made for this law. Of course, it doesn't touch those 23,000 concessions. Mining will, will be now more than ever going to the max. They come with everything and for everything, as we say. And if there's something that can be done, would be to forbid mining so that these industries or companies can be judged and for there to be some kind of punishment, prison for those who are committing these crimes against entire communities that are being disappeared. And we, and with our co-workers or our friends for, from Colombia that say, we don't want to be zones of, or areas of sacrifice because that it's becoming zones of extermination. So we think that, that we haven't gone deep with the problem in the mining situation, what's really happening is that they're, we're trying to put on band-aids and there's a big scandal about those little band-aids as if that's gonna create actual change. Thank you, Esperanza. Um, Leah, any any thoughts on, on, on that? Well, I'll, I'll just say that uh, in the petition, we, we outline a number of ways that uh, um, that Canada could have helped protect Mr. Varka. Uh, there are lots of ways they could have done that, and they didn't. They didn't do any of them. Um, one of the ways, uh, which kind of goes a bit to uh, Esperanza's point, is to conduct human rights due diligence before even allowing a project like this to go forward, where it where it happened. Um, so, you know, mandatory human rights due diligence legislation, uh, mandatory human rights due diligence on the part of the Canadian government and the, the Canadian embassy that's advocating for these companies. You know, like if the, you're, you want a company wants to start a mining project in an area where uh, uh, human rights are an issue where there's going to be big, uh, great risk to human rights and the environment, then uh or if the community says no, <laughs> or um, uh, doesn't give their consent, then the project shouldn't go forward. I think that's pretty clear. Um, in terms of other things that uh, Canada could have done in, in this case, uh, once the project was, was already happening, um, I'm just reading from the petition they could have, uh, taken diplomatic steps to encourage Mexico to protect Mr. Abarca. They could have conditioned their support for the company on its efforts to protect human rights defenders. And then we also list just a whole list of, I mean, Canada has a policy on this. It's, it's the voices at risk policy. It lists lots of different ways that that uh, um, Canada could have helped uh, uh, um, protect Mr. Abarca in this case. So. Um, regular contact and information exchanges with human rights defenders. So actually speaking with him and uh, getting the opinion of the affected community, enhancing visibility for human rights defenders, engaging with local authorities, um, visiting detained human rights defenders. They did, they did not visit Mr. Abarca when he was detained without charge, making public statements uh, in support of human rights defenders. Um, so those are just some examples. Thank you. And continuing on the subject of support and solidarity, um, final question, um, which I'll pose first to Jose Luis is, um, how can civil society continue to support your family as, as you return to Mexico? Uh, Brian wants to know if there's petitions we can send to our government or sign. If anyone has the answer to that, please post it in the chat or let us know. But more generally, um, how can how can we support you? First of all, 
I think uh, the way of supporting us in this situation is to, of uh, the situation of great danger is, is to uh, publish communiques to your authorities, increase people's consciousness about this topic, about the situations in mining, the defense of human rights, as my father would say, to promote To promote our petition, it would be very important right now that we have been, we have presented this uh, lawsuit to the commission. It's important for it to be known and the support that we have with other, with other organizations to, ju to just speak maintaining contact because we're in a, con a conflict zone and that requires a lot of attention. I'd also like to say that the way in which the Canadian people can support is to be watching over your own institutions and demanding that they do their job because they these are public resources that are being used for example, in the case of the embassy, these are public resources. These are your resources, uh, those of you who are paying for these institutions to go and violate uh, communities uh, and to support these companies. And on a, uh, in addition, there's investors who may be watching, who are surely watching now and the population in general, uh, often through our pensions, through your pensions, these resources are being used to invest in these projects. So we want to assure you that your investment will be greatly multiplied, but you would need to think about this and become conscious of what is the cost of this investment and of this return to the investment, the cost in lives and blood, in uh, lack of security and forced displacement that communities are experiencing in all of Latin America and I'm sure all over the world due to these projects that are imposed and that are and that completely violate human rights. So this is a petition, a request that we make for Canadian people to also be watchful of what is happening in your name. I think that's an excellent note on which to uh, conclude the discussion. Uh, and it's all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much again to Jose Luis, to Esperanza, to Leah, um, please, please support the work of our panelists. Uh, let's call on Canada um, to take immediate steps to end support for Canadian mines in the global south that are linked to the violence we've heard about today and to the human rights violations. Um, let's demand that Canada respect um, defenders, um, human rights defenders, um, and the right of communities to say no to mining. Um, we also uh, need this so that human rights defenders and environment defenders like Mariano Abarca are no longer put in danger uh, for protecting their land um, against Canadian mines. So there's some concrete steps that Canada can take, including passing mandatory human rights due diligence legislation um, and strengthening the voices at risk policy by creating mechanisms to ensure that public officials are actually abiding by it. Uh, and with that, I want to extend um, solidarity and heartfelt thank yous to the Abarca family for continuing to fight uh, for justice for Mariano, a fight that we know has implications for all environmental defenders. 
Let's find ways to support their struggle and these zones of extermination, um, as Esperanza said, and watch over our own country's institutions where we have power. So I wish you uh, all the best uh, with the rest of the tour in Canada. I want to remind people at home that they can find out more by going to the website justiceformariano.net, uh, written with the four, um, to find out more details about uh, how Canada, uh, how Canada's Mexican embassy is implicated uh, in the assassination of Mariano Abarca, and, um, and to help bring justice uh, to those responsible for these crimes. So I want to thank Mining Watch Canada for their organizational work um, to put this important panel together and the many, many organizations that supported this event. I also want to thank the translators, uh, Talis and Mojde, as well for their terrific translation work and for helping to bring this discussion to a wider audience. Thank you, Viviana, for your wonderful moderation and organizing. Um, Esperanza, thank you again for your words today and your brave work with Rema. Leah, thank you for your comments and congratulations to JCAP for bringing forward this groundbreaking complaint. Thank you, Jose Luis, uh, for continuing the struggle. Uh, we wish you justice for your beloved father. Um, that's it for our program today uh, and good night, everyone.